welcome everyone to Powder River Basin Resource Council 49th Annual Meeting. I'm Marcia Westcott, Chair of the Board of Directors. And on behalf of the board, I'm pleased to welcome both Powder River members and friends and visitors to this site from the wider community to this evening's keynote portion of our annual meeting. Now on to the main event, the whole reason we've logged in here tonight. I'm honored to introduce our speaker, Jason Baldas, whose life and work give me hope. An enrolled member of Eastern Shoshone who lives on the Wind River Reservation, Jason is an advocate and an educator on indigenous culture cultural revitalization and ecological restoration. He has served as director of the Wind River Native Advocacy Center, where he was instrumental in passing the Wyoming Indi Indian Education Act for All, which just finally got included in the official curriculum for our schools. It's now part of that curriculum. So. Congratulations to Jason and congratulations to all school children in Wyoming. They will benefit and we as a state will benefit immensely. Jason has undergraduate and graduate degrees in land resources and environmental sciences from Montana State University. And he's currently the Tribal Buffalo Coordinator for Tribal Partnerships Program at the National Wildlife Federation. In his advocacy work and in his writings, which I've read, Jason demonstrates that ecological restoration is inextricably linked to cultural revitalization, to education, history, reverence for the land, and healing from past atrocities. He writes, Buffalo restoration is a story of hope. I'm looking forward to learning about that story tonight. In Jason's talk, Reimagining Wyoming Buffalo, Transformation and Sustainability. So Jason, it's all yours. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to visit with you all this evening. I um, very much appreciate and I'm humbled to be able to do this type of work. Um, and I, I um, am also humbled by the amount of support that uh, I received from people that visit with um, new community members, other people across the state and region, and across the, the planet, really, because uh, this is a, a, a pretty robust effort uh, to, to do this type of work. You know, 10 years ago, it didn't exist. So I am uh, feel very privileged to have this conversation with you all. There's a lot of people who work very hard uh, to get where we are um, for, for decades prior to, to me being involved in it. And so definitely have to recognize those who fought uh, very hard uh, over, over the years before me. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen. I um, wanna again, thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening and thanks for the invitation. And I really appreciate uh, using this image that was up on social media, uh, out there uh, advertising this discussion this evening. Um, you know, reimagining Wyoming, Buffalo transformation and sustainability, very uh, cutting edge types of, of conversation. And so I'm very, very glad to uh, be here this evening. I work for the National Wildlife Federation as a tribal Buffalo program manager. Uh, you're, you can uh, contact me there at that email address. I'm a member of the Eastern Shoshone tribe here.
here on uh, the Wind River Indian Reservation in Wyoming. And uh, this is our tribal emblem. Notice the, the, the dates of 1863 and 1868. Those are the two treaties, uh, the years of the treaties with the Shoshone tribe. And you can notice there's a buffalo right there in the center of that emblem uh, sim symbolically uh, that uh, the Shoshone people, we distinguished ourselves by the foods we ate. And the Eastern band of Shoshone, we refer to ourselves as the Wichundika, the buffalo eaters. Uh, over in Idaho were the fish eaters, the sheep eaters in, in the high elevation, the rabbit eaters. Um, so we were referred to as those that ate buffalo. Uh, this is uh, our logo for the Tribal Partnerships Program of the National Wildlife Federation. Uh, also symbolic of the historic relationship that National Wildlife Federation has had with the tribes at Wind River. Uh, going back to the water rights case, uh, the longest running court case in the history of Wyoming is who controls water on the reservation. And if you're familiar with that story, uh, that would take a whole nother evening to talk about. So uh, something that you can definitely look into uh, to understand more. I uh, also sit on the board of directors for the Intertribal Buffalo Council. Uh, ITBC is, uh, began in 92. And at that time, it had 19 member tribes. Uh, we now have uh, 76 member tribes of the Intertribal Buffalo Council. Uh, we're actually working on legislation called the Indian Buffalo Management Act that uh, just recently passed through the House and Senate Natural Resource Committees. Uh, it's got bipartisan support, <clears throat> but what it does is, is uh, appropriate federal dollars to assist or support buffalo restoration as a treaty right. And after a little while, we'll talk a little bit more about that. This is the logo for the Conservation Lands Foundation. I also sit on the board of trustees for this organization working to reprioritize our public lands in the West. And so uh, this organization works the, uh, diligently to support tribally led uh, organizations working across the West in uh, protection of sacred sites. Uh, holy places important to uh, the Native tribes. I have received my undergraduate, <coughs> excuse me, my undergraduate and graduate degrees in land resources and environmental science at Montana State University. I focused my uh, entire academic career for the most part on bison restoration. I also uh, was able to uh, visit Russia, uh, New Zealand, Denmark a couple times to also uh, look at other indigenous cultures and how they're working to reintegrate their traditional foods, uh, exercise their indigenous rights uh, to food sovereignty. And we'll talk a little bit more about food sovereignty in a bit. So we've got uh, the buffalo on our flag in Wyoming, but we are a, essentially a cowboy state uh, for the most part. Our reservation, uh, the rest of the, is, is, is pretty secluded from uh, the rest of uh, the state. Uh, there's another map that I'd like to show, uh, this one here, that is available through the Wyoming Migration Initiative. But this is a, a place-based map with uh, names in our languages. So if we were to look across the state, uh, you could look on this map and find how we say those types of words in Shoshone or Arapaho or Crow. Uh, and so this is very important, especially for organizations that are out there looking to provide land acknowledgements or, or things to recognize where uh, you are on the landscape and recognize that there have been people there for uh, over 20,000 years. Uh, we now have that evidence uh, across uh, many places in the US that, that are older than 20,000 years. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, the history of uh, traditional, the history of indigenous people on this continent uh, goes back a very, very, very long time, uh, despite what uh, the lack of uh, education about, again, the importance of the Indian education for all bill in Wyoming and emphasizing the understanding of some of this history. 
So in this discussion this evening, you know, we, we, we highlighted uh, Buffalo, you know, why Buffalo? Why bison? And you hear me uh, use that term interchangeably because well, bison, bison, bison is the scientific name for the plains buffalo. Uh, bison, bison Athabasca is the wood bison uh, in, uh, in the Arctic and in Northern Canada. Uh, there's extinct species of bison. Well, it was uh, 1616 that uh, Samuel de Champlain uh, called this animal and it was referenced in a journal, uh, Buffalo. Uh, he recognized this as a similar animal, animal to what the French had seen in India as water buffalo in Africa, the Cape Buffalo. But that French term uh, stuck with the indigenous people. Uh, of course, there's 330 different languages on this continent. We all have our terms, our names for the animal in our own language, but in terms of its translation into English, uh, bison wasn't really used until the 1730s, I believe. And so uh, buffalo in terms of our native communities is the more preferred term. Uh, I have friends that have buffalo in their, in their names. Uh, there was a, a colleague that I went to school with at Montana State and uh, he was from the Blackfeet tribe and his uh, last name was Fast Buffalo Horse. Well, he's not gonna change his name to bison just because scientists say that bison bison is the correct term. This is a term that we're gonna continue to refer to them in our languages. So for me, my story goes back a little bit further. And so I wanna fill you in and give you a little bit of insight as to why uh, Buffalo has been a primary focus for my, my academics and, and also my profession. A lot of it goes back to my dad and uh, him being a, a wildlife biologist. I spent a lot of time with my father growing up in the back country of our reservation. Uh, he worked on, uh, for the US Fish and Wildlife Service. He was in a very unique position as a federal employee, but also a, a tribal member. And so he was in a, in a way exercising uh, the federal trust responsibility uh, to the tribes uh, in terms of wildlife and management. He worked to implement a game code in 1984. He worked to protect fisheries during that longest running court case, the water rights case, the bighorn case. When he retired, he was ultimately, you know, uh, uh, respected for what he predicted would happen did. And that was that if we managed our wildlife populations, that eventually we would have significant numbers where our tribal members would be able to utilize them for sustenance in a way that we always did. We were always hunters, always fishermen. We gathered from the landscape. And so uh, as a child, I witnessed the reintroduction of pronghorn antelope and bighorn sheep. Uh, these, piece, these species were extirpated prior to 1984 due to unregulated hunting. When the pronghorn antelope was reintroduced, my dad told me that we'd be hunting these animals in 10 years, that I'd be able to harvest one. But they did so well that I was able to harvest one only eight years later. And I've harvested one every year since. This animal uh, was restored, was managed on our reservation, and with the same with, with bighorn sheep. With the restoration, with the, the work that my dad had uh, set out to do to restore the wildlife species, on the reservation, uh, he he was he was met with a lot of opposition. When I asked my dad for advice on what to do as a career, even though he is a federal employee, he told me, "Don't work for the federal government, don't work for state government, and don't work for tribal government." And that was very interesting to me because I I really took his advice to heart. That's left me with academia nonprofits and entrepreneurship. And so his advice has led to a lot of the success of the work in terms of Buffalo because I'm not under the bureaucracy of some of those agencies. My dad and I had a chance to take a trip to East Africa back in uh, 97. Uh, I was uh, 18 years old. This was a very influential time uh, for me. I, 
experienced many, many cool uh, experiences there. And I was obviously much skinnier at that time. Um, but the experience of the wildebeest, uh, seeing these animals uh, across the landscape was uh, really incredible. Uh, it's like driving 100 miles and as far as you can see in all directions was these wildebeest. And you count 30 other species, at least in this migration from predators to other ungulates, um, giraffes, lions, hyenas, cheetahs. Uh, but what was really most uh, unfathomable for me was that this is less than 5% of what the bison was here less than 200 years ago. Wildebeest migration is one and a half million. Lewis and Clark in 1802, 1804, they witnessed 30 to 60 million bison. And so that's an incredible uh, number. When I came home, uh, I had a newfound appreciation for where I wanted to know more. And unfortunately, a lot of what you learn is not very uh, appealing type of history. You learn about like things like manifest destiny and how manifest destiny drove this social notion that because native people were non-Christian, uh, that we could not have any land ownership. This notion of manifest destiny drove much of the colonial attitudes and uh, things as uh, deprivation uh, over the decades after. Uh, after understanding a little bit about treaties, which by Webster's Dictionary are the supreme laws of the land, there were over 800 treaties made with native tribes. 400 of them were ratified by Congress, but every single treaty has been broken or violated uh, in some way, form, or fashion. And despite treaties being the supreme law of the land. So what you learn and you come to understand is that uh, the history of bison or buffalo is very similar to that of native people that we are now on remnants of our once former vast territories. Buffalo exist in parks and refuges and private ranches and Native Americans are now on reservations. Although a lot of native people live off reservation, they live in urban, in the urban environment. Nonetheless, the story of uh, buffalo um, is, is not a very pleasant one. Uh, the, oftentimes only the hides and tongues were taken, the meat and bones were left on the prairie, the hides were shipped east, made into and fueled the industrial revolution into big belts for the machinery. Uh, described that the bones littered the prairie in the middle of summer that, enough that it looked like snow. But it really was the annihilation of the largest world's largest migratory herd in world history. And it was in order to remove the food source for the native people, to subjugate us to reservations, to remove our food source. And this was congressionally encouraged. Uh, it, it's on the record of the, the attitude that uh, was towards the Buffalo, especially after the defeat of Custer at the Battle of the Little Bighorn when uh, the Northern, the Arapaho and the Cheyenne and the Ogallalas defeated Custer. Then it became uh, much more ambitious. The federal government was uh, um, really determined to take control of what they, can, what they viewed as the Indian problem. After the buffalo were eliminated and tribes were subjugated to reservations, it really made way for these large beef operations to come. And Lonesome Dove, you know, the, the, the story of bringing beef west and from Canada to Mexico. And, uh, you know, essentially it was because the bison were gone and, and, and the tribes were overcome. Well, cattle and sheep and domestic animals are, are essentially invasive species. They were brought from Europe. They are, uh, have uh, a, a difficult time often in, in even freeze to death. Uh, cattle, in an effort to make a stronger cow, they created cattle 
gene and aggression. So what they did was breed domestic cows with, with buffalo, uh, creating what is termed cattle. Uh, you switch to the male to female ratio and you get beefalo. And this was an effort to make cows that wouldn't freeze to death, that weren't susceptible to the weather, that were hardier. Uh, but really what this caused is, is, a, is, a, is a threat to the bison genome. Cattle gene introgression. Look at the United States and the buffalo in the nation. 95% of the bison have cattle gene introgression. Most of those animals, 90% of them, are, are managed for commercial meat production. These are genetically manipulated. They've had unnatural male to female ratios. They're uh, oftentimes grain fed in a similar feedlot situation as cows. So the animals or the conservation buffalo that I focus on is there in the yellow and red. The Department of Interior manages conservation buffalo across 19 herds. There's uh, several tribal herds like ours at Wind River that are considered conservation buffalo. These are animals that have the most reputable genetics, the most reputable Yellowstone genetics. And they're also managed for the most part under natural regulating factors, predation if possible. Um, you know, the a natural female to male ratio of 60-40. Uh, animals are not supplementally fed. They have enough land base to utilize to exist on their own. And ultimately, animals are pop or populations that have at least a thousand individuals, uh, because that is a number needed to maintain the heterogeneity of the population to prevent a bottleneck. Uh, so this sliver here indicates the need for establishing more satellite populations of conservation buffalo have those genetics, but also are managed or recognized for their role ecologically. And we, we call that as wildlife today. Most often we have to fight that distinction of whether buffalo are considered wildlife or livestock. And that distinction can really put them under the auspices of livestock boards, uh, farming and ranching interests, uh, as opposed to the ecological or the biological um, interests of, of understanding bison as ecosystem engineers and their importance as a keystone species on the landscape. This is why there's so much interest in Yellowstone bison is because of those, those genetics. And so there's many tribes very interested in uh, establishing or improving their genetic um, health with those Yellowstone animals. Fort Peck, uh, the reservation up there in northeastern Montana, north of Poplar, uh, has been leading the way. They've received over 300 Yellowstone bison that they work closely with the Intertribal Buffalo Council to distribute to assist and build our tribal herds. Some pretty cool, interesting history about buffalo that have been here for 300,000 years. Uh, from essentially the um, Arctic all the way to Mexico and from nearly the East Coast all the way to the West Coast, there's four extinct species of bison, Occidentalis, Priscus, Antiquus, and Latifrons. Of course, we compare that to, uh, you know, the Latifrons of the 15-foot horn span uh, with a, a, a large plains bison. You can see uh, how much larger that was. Uh, and of course, we, we know that we find their bones. Uh, there is evidence of buffalo uh, being exposed all the time. These animals, along with the pronghorn, were, uh, you know, of course, were here along with the woolly mammoth and uh, short faced bear and the giant sloth. So, bison have been on this continent for a very, very long time. Now, plains bison have some unique behaviors that physiological adaptations that ensure that they have uh, a very important role on the landscape. They wallow. They create these micro depressions. Uh, it's very important for water accumulation. As they roll, they are important in seed dispersal. Um, this behavior um, 
very important ecologically, part of how they are ecosystem engineers. Uh, as a keystone species, they benefit many organisms from butterflies to lepidopterans, uh, uh, while butterflies are lepidopterans, uh, salamanders, reptiles in tall grass prairie, in short elevation uh, and uh, short grass prairie, they, they're beneficial to uh, things like prairie dogs and black-footed ferrets and badgers, four-legged animals and critters like uh, uh, birds that are listed as a species of concern, like the ferruginous hawk and a burrowing owl mountain plover. As we restore buffalo, these species return. And a lot of it is uh, because a lot of birds re require buffalo hair for their eggs to reach the right incubation temperature. The cowbird, that's a misnomer. It should be called the buffalo bird. Um, any of these bird species are very culturally important. Uh, sage grouse, very important uh, bird for many of our Plains Indians tribes. If you've ever been to a powwow, if you've ever been to one of our social celebrations, uh, this dance, this this bird is, is, is uh, met, uh, replicated in our regalia. Uh, so it has a lot of historical cultural importance to many. My own thesis research was looking at cultural plant biodiversity and relic wallows. So I was looking at these wallows that hadn't been used in 130 years, but you could still see them and uh, ask the question, uh, do these uh, serve a purpose in plant biodiversity, um, even though buffalo haven't used them for so long? I measured uh, 75 different locations, looked in the, did a pair T test to compare inside plant biodiversity versus outside. What was determined was that these three species actually still in fact benefit uh, from those relic wallows. And these are uh, three cultural plants important for uh, foods, metal, uh, food, foods, medicines, uh, and tool. If we look historically, the health and wealth of our communities was directly related to the biodiversity of the plants and animals. Our people relied on the abundance of these species that we were placed with here on this planet together with. And so uh, prior to European arrival, prior to Lewis and Clark, our people thrive because of our connection and understanding and relationship, the variety of species that we have. Our people, our leadership, uh, they utilized vast territories. They uh, went for different resources at different times of the year. Uh, our people had an intricate understanding about where to go for clean water, for buffalo, for pronghorn antelope, how to acquire food. So I often think about uh, these, these grandmas and grandpas and what their values were before colonization, before uh, our language was, was eradicated, before our, our ceremonies were outlawed. I want to ensure that what we do today honors these people because of what they fought for. And so if we look at the distribution of our tribes, when our reservations were created, they understood that we used a vast territory. So the area in light gray, for instance, was the Treaty of 1863. That's 44 million acres, and of course it was before the states. But only five years later, it was reduced by 41 million acres, roughly to the size it is there in black. So in a span of five years, the Shoshone tribe lost 42 million acres from a failed promise in our treaty. So if we look at that small reservation that was in black, there were subsequent diversions and subsequent losses of land, like from Lander to South Pass, we call that the Bruno Session. Shoshone tribe got $25,000. The area around Thermopolis was the McLaughlin Agreement. That was supposed to be one mile by one mile, but he put zeros on it and made it 10 miles by 10. 
The most detrimental act of Congress was probably the General Allotment Act that opened up reservations for homesteading. And so they did that north on lands north of the Big Wind River in 1906. Fortunately, in 1939, some lands uh, were returned to the tribes, except that area uh, north of and including Riverton, which isn't included, it doesn't include itself in, in being part of the reservation because this land was opened up for homesteading. Any of our lands that were previously held are now wilderness area, national parks, and national forests. But tribes are excluded from many of those conversations. So here's an example of lands that were uh, removed from tribal ownership. Uh, despite all of these things happening, the tribes in the 30s really recognized that without doing something, without making a, a decision to preserve, to conserve, to protect, uh, more was going to be lost. Because in the 30s, there were thousands of cows coming in. The lands were being divided up and Bureau of Reclamation had come in to divert water to, damp, to build dams. Uh, they were floating railroad ties all the way by Dubois down the Wind River for railroad. The leadership in the 1930s recognized that if they didn't protect something, uh, we were going to continue to lose. So with their leadership, 26 years before the Federal Wilderness Act, the tribes designated a wilderness roadless area. And this roadless, this is 180,000 acres. There's 265 lakes on the reservation. 200 of them exist in this wilderness area and several hundred miles of rivers and streams. So this was an early attempt to protect our resources on the reservation. In the 1980s, the tribes exercising sovereignty decided to write a game code. Uh, I mentioned my dad was involved with this, this, this tribal regulation that put seasons and bag limits on our wildlife species. It was highly controversial at the time, but what was predicted would happen did, and that was that if we protect and put seasons on our wildlife, it's gonna allow for the restoration and growth of those populations to levels where we've never seen. Even though this data is old, uh, you can see the influence of uh, the populations on our reservation. So we've successfully managed six of the seven historic ungulate species on this reservation, including the wolves and bears. And this is very important because many see wolves and bears as a threat. Um, but for native people, and it was it was uh, very important to include the perspectives of our elders in these documents. So in the late 90s, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the tribes, they went for three years to our elders to compile the perspectives about wolves and bears into our management. So that when these documents were written, it would be emphasized that we as native people respect predators for their role. They have a place, they are important, and they are our relatives. They are our kin. We've learned how to be good human beings by emulating a lot of their, um, their ways of knowing and behavior. So it's written in our management plans that we respect those species. We have an ecological based knowledge system. And that drives more of our decisions than an economic based system, which many of, uh, which drives many, many of our paradigms of today. But we can draw upon that knowledge from our elders. We can draw upon that from uh, our past so that we can implement those types of things into our modern contemporary management. Very important that we continue those worldviews, those philosophies, those life ways, understanding the natural laws, the, the principles that exist, and ensure a more holistic way of managing our resources. In order to really understand 
what it is is happening not only for tribes at Wind River, but tribes everywhere. Uh, and it's lot, lot, largely because there's a lack of education about this history. But we have to understand the eras of federal Indian law and policy. And these are, this is that not so pretty history uh, of going back to the arrival of Columbus and, and the establishment of the reservation era uh, with Andrew Jackson and his removal policy. You heard of the Trail of Tears, the uh, allotment era, I mentioned the general allotment up that op opened up reservations for homesteading. Uh, the effort to dismantle our tribal government system, our, our sovereignty in the reorganization era and termination era. A lot of our people were encouraged to leave the reservation in the 60s to go to urban areas, essentially to open up more reservation lands to encroachment. Today we're in the self-determination era, and that is a very important uh, um, time for us because self-determination really means that we can self-govern, we can bring back culture, we can promote economic development that's appropriate, we can dis control our decisions, policies, and programs. And understanding the role of the federal government in trust responsibility, which it's a legal obligation that most people are, are unfamiliar with these terms, uh, but it's very important in understanding the, the role of uh, and the distinction uh, that tribes have, because what we have is, is really sovereignty. And there, that, that goes back to those treaties. So even though every treaty has been violated or broken, the language still exists in federal Indian law and policy that's being upheld. It's still being, it still is legitimate in, in, the, in the court of law. And so is food sovereignty, and that is that we have the right to appropriate food. That brings us back to Buffalo. And there is a lot of effort across Indian country to restore this animal, to revitalize this relationship that we've had since time immemorial. Because we've had a relationship for thousands of years. If you look at the span of time, 130 years is actually not that long. These animals are still in our DNA. They are still very important that uh, we reconnect with these animals, not only on the dinner table, but also in the sweat lodge or in the songs and the prayers, in the ability to uh, hunt one and take it in the way that uh, our grandmas and grandpas um, would have liked to have. As that animal was life's commissary. You know, we may not have to go back to making our clothing and our in our houses out of Buffalo, but there is a very, very important contemporary role that Buffalo has back into our lives again. And we have not forgotten how we utilize this animal, how we make tools, how we utilize the parts, which are important for eating, uh, how we prepare uh, and dismantle this animal is a very important ceremony and process in itself. So bringing back these uses of buffalo for our children is, is a very important part of cultural revitalization, uh, understanding who we are. It's very important as a meat source. It's the lowest or very low in fat, uh, calories and cholesterol, but high in protein, iron and vitamins. Uh, as this animal was removed from our diet, it's resulted in the highest rates of diabetes and heart disease and other health related issues. So as we begin to incorporate this animal into our diet again, it's really essentially healing uh, from the inside out. We're beginning to have federal support like the Bison Conservation Initiative that prioritizes many of the same ideas that we as tribes have, that we need wild, healthy bison herds that we need to prioritize their genetics, uh, the conservation animals, uh, prioritize the, the partnership working together, uh, shared stewardship, understanding their role as a keystone species in ecological restoration. 
cultural restoration, uh, the importance of that animal to our tribal communities. We have federal legislation now. I'm actually traveling to DC next week um, for the Indian Buffalo Management Act. It passed through the House Natural Resource Committee a couple of weeks ago when it was uh, introduced on the Senate side by Senator Rounds and Heinrich. We have bipartisan support for this. We're just figuring out whether we need to package it or make it a standalone bill. But this is this is uh, the federal government's trust responsibility in legislation as we speak about how we can help and assist building our tribal buffalo programs. Moves continue to hit the ground. Uh, two weeks ago, we brought 47 animals from a new partnership between the Nature Conservancy and the Intertribal Buffalo Council. 27 of those animals went to the Eastern Shoshone, bringing our population to uh, 66 animals. 20 of those went to the Northern Arapaho, bringing their population to 32 animals. And so we continue to grow our populations with the intent that one day we'll have the ability to manage them as a wildlife species. Uh, the two tribes here at Wind River, even though we're historic enemies, we are all Buffalo people. Both tribes commissary for our grandmas and grandpas was Buffalo. We have to continue to ensure that our young people are grounded and have a foundation again in Buffalo. You know, part of uh, my uh, own self-identity growing up, waking up in the morning and wondering, how come I can't speak my language? What happened to my history that, that that language isn't there for me? Well, many of our young people feel that way. And so bringing Buffalo back is like putting a piece of our identity back that was taken or ripped away from us. We can work through Buffalo to reinvigorate our language. We can continue to partner with people who are supportive of, of this type of uh, an outlook. National Wildlife Federation, the largest member-based conservation organization has creating a new tribal strategy to be able to better partner and better support tribes in their sovereignty, in their self-determination, in their restoration of their traditional food sources. Many of these issues could impact off-reservation. I mentioned that many of our lands adjacent to the reservation are wilderness, national forest, national park. It should be that just because these are federal, uh, federal lands that have, were, were taken, it doesn't diminish our tribal uh, connection and history to those places. So is there ways that this buffalo could um, influence decisions in the, at the state level? You know, I don't know. Uh, these, this is a tribal buffalo restoration effort to manage buffalo and wildlife. Now, you know, Buffalo is, uh, is a different story when we're talking about public land uh, in the rest of the state. That's going to take a, uh, a concerted effort. You know, uh, the Wind River Reservation uh, is, is a remnant of what, our, of what our territory once was. This is what we've got to work with. This is uh, a significant step for the tribes in restoring Buffalo. We still have a long way to go to actually get to where we are managing them as wildlife. We have to protect them under our own codes and regulations and retire grazing permits and range units where we can prioritize Buffalo habitat. So there is a still uh, significant strides that are, need to be made even at Wind River. But the conversation keeps coming up is why don't we have more buffalo on our tribe on our public lands in the state? There's a lot of areas. For instance, the Red Desert, largest unfenced area in the nation, 180 miles wide and 100 miles north to south. If we could work to prioritize ecological integrity, to manage our lands more holistically, maybe to incorporate some of the philosophies of our native people. You know, the Red Desert in its entirety was included in the 1863 treaty. And just now, uh, tribes are being welcomed to conversation, to how do we protect some of these areas? Maybe it's bison restoration, 
maybe it's retiring oil and gas permits. There's a whole host of issues that we have in the state when in terms of energy. Um, my hope is that we will continue to take a more holistic approach though, because there is evidence we've been here for 20,000 years, even as, as soon as uh, uh, a month ago, uh, not even that, September 23rd. Uh, we've got more evidence that, that we native people been here 20,000 years at least. And so there's some things that uh, native people understood and still understand about how we can treat this place better. For instance, look at the uh, number of domestic livestock that we have today, as opposed to uh, in the past. Domestic livestock make up a tremendous problem. But an interesting factoid is that indigenous people, we still have this understanding because of our connection, holistic view of uh, our place on, on this planet. Even though we're 4% of the world's population live on just 22% of the earth's surface, on that land is 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. That's a very important statistic because maybe we can reverse that idea of manifest destiny. Maybe we can incorporate some of our traditional Native American belief systems and uh, understanding of how we treat the planet, how we relate to things like wolves and bears, buffalo, uh, fish, and look at things more ecologically as opposed to economically, because that economic driver is often going to uh, conflict with what we need to do to heal ourselves. The buffalo will always be our way of education, even though it's been gone for 130 years. We've not forgotten the importance of this animal in our, in our lives. It's not just for native people because the buffalo is a story about American, about America. It's important to all Americans to understand this story. And if we can incorporate a more holistic understanding of what native people knew and know about this, the cosmos, that everything happens in circles and cycles. Everything on the planet is representative of the cyclical nature of life. We have a live by a set of rules, natural laws, principles like polarity that is well understood now that we know that there are cycles, circles that exist on this planet that everything is interconnected, interwoven, related. What we do to the earth, we do to ourselves. It's written in stone. And we are all here on this planet together. And we are all here in Wyoming uh, together. Uh, we share uh, our regions. So it's very important, I think, to uh, find common ground to work together for the benefit of future generations. Our people always talked about seven generations ahead, that decisions we think of now should affect them in the future. My hope is that I can go hunt buffalo with my grandkids as wildlife. That is the driver of all of this. When I go back to thinking about East Africa with my dad and seeing those wildebeest and how come we don't have buffalo at home? It was because someday, we just want to go hunt buffalo. And so with that, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, you can find more information at nwf.org slash tribal bison. And if you are interested in supporting my efforts in the tribal partnerships program, uh, there's also a link there, give to buffalo.nwf.org, where you would uh, be able to contribute uh, to help support this work and support the efforts not only at Wind River uh, but in developing partners with partnerships with other tribes and uh, those ones out there that uh, are working to restore Buffalo back to their tribal communities and so um, with that I would like to uh, go ahead and open it up for any discussion comments, 
questions. Uh, it's good to see some familiar faces out there. How are you doing, Chessie? Good to see you. So yeah, uh, anybody want to go? Uh, we could. Uh, I could also look in the chat box. Looks like we got 48 participants. That's really awesome. Really want to thank you guys for spending your evening learning a little bit about Buffalo. I know that uh, some people uh, uh, are skeptical of Buffalo. Um, and um, I think that's decreasing. Most people are very supportive of, of this work and I'm thankful uh, for all of you joining in to hear a little bit more, so. Uh, thank you, Jason. Thank you so much. And thank you for both the information as well as the spirit of interconnectedness that really was very deeply moving. So thank you. Um, Monica, do we have some questions in the, the chat that you could read aloud for everybody to hear and Jason to respond to? Sure. Um, thank you so much, Jason. That was a really excellent presentation. Um, and I'm just really appreciative of your work and your time. Um, the first question we have is, uh, and you might be able to see this as well. Do you work with the Prairie Preserve in Montana, Jason? I don't. Uh, I know of those guys, the American Prairie Reserve. They're working uh, to get buffalo managed. They're trying to loop in the tribes there. I I know of those people, and I, but I don't work specifically with them. Uh, and uh, I forgot one. I've got one little surprise, and I'm going to try it. Uh, we just uh, produced a uh, a short video of the release that just happened two weeks ago. And what I'd like to do is try to share that and we'll see if it works. It's a, just a short, short video. Uh, and let's see, let's give it a go. Did that come through for everybody? 
Yeah, we could see it, Jason, and um, very neat. Thank you so much for sharing that video with us. Yeah, that's uh, that's brand new. That's not even out there yet. So you guys, you guys lucked out. Sneak peek. Um, the next question we have for you is what can we as, you know, members or leaders or staff members at Powder River Basin Resource Council do to support your work? Well, you know, uh, money always helps. And I know we always say that. Uh, what I'm, I'm, I'm working to raise money to buy fee land uh, north of the river, the Wind River, in some of those lands that were acquired through the General Allotment Act. A lot of those lands went for pennies per acre back in 1887. Well, now they go for 3,000 an acre. And so, in order to piece back, uh, to, to build, contiguous habitat for buffalo, especially on the Shoshone side or the north side of the river, it's important to buy back some of those land lands so that uh, it's like buffalo, it's land rematriation through buffalo restoration. We're raising the money to buy back these fee lands, convert them into buffalo habitat, and over time then they will go into trust. They will go back to the reservation. And so as opposed to losing jurisdiction or losing land base, like we are in other parts of the reservation, here we're restoring land and we're also protecting uh, a pretty good stretch of the Wind River from further development, for more agriculture, for more, agri more, more center pivots or cattle uh, on the river and, and that sort of thing. So it's, it's a way to promote land use change prioritizing ecological integrity, restoring the keystone species, so therefore it's ecological restoration. Uh, there was, uh, you know, the, you could, the legislative support, you know, reaching out to your Congress people to support the Indian Buffalo Management Act. Uh, I, I put the link up there towards the end, I could, uh, you know, give to buffalo.nwf.org. So that supports my work through the National Wildlife Federation. Um, so those are a couple couple routes. Uh, hopefully that was helpful. I wish I could say, you know, more. Yeah, thanks, Jason. And we'll be sharing that link um, with everyone that registered when it's live. Um, I don't think it's live right now. Have you had any, have you been able to access that donate page? Uh, it should have been. So um, we're actually working on that right now. Like as we speak, I'm like next, next week, like the button should work. So if it's not yeah. working right now, within the next week, it should, so. Great. Uh, there's been a lot of interest uh, kind of around being able to provide dollars to support this effort and we're trying to make that as easy as we can through a large conservation organization uh, which can create its own types of challenges but. yeah most definitely and we'll share that link with everyone that registered to the event so keep your keep your eyes out folks for an email from us next week um, the next question we have is, are there any organizations or agencies that have been supportive of this work? And um, th this member that asked did say that they heard you say the Nature Conservancy and also, obviously also the National Wildlife um, Federation, but is there any others you want to highlight? Oh, sure. There's uh, the uh, World Wildlife Fund. Uh, Defenders of Wildlife, uh, National Parks Conservation Association, um, Greater Yellowstone Coalition, the Wyoming Outdoor Council, um, Defenders of Wildlife, I think I said that. Uh, so those are some NGOs, some organizations that kind of work uh, with tribes in a number of capacities across the US. Uh, federal or state agencies, uh, less so, uh, you know, the federal government doesn't have a very good track record of keeping trust responsibility to tribes. So uh, as entities or NGOs, a lot of that support is to facilitate that. 
So not so much uh, from the state agencies either. You know, state doesn't have jurisdiction on reservation or tribal lands. And so that's where sovereignty and self-determination come into play. So, you know, there's been a more collaboration and partnership that's happened with uh, non-governmental organizations than there has with agencies. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, the next question we got is our Wyoming, is our Wyoming members of Congress um, supportive of the proposed legislation on Buffalo? I wish I could say yeah, uh, but I don't think so. Uh, you know, we've been working on the Indian Buffalo Management Act for a couple of years and uh, you know, two years ago I was in DC to lobby I met with uh, Cheney's uh, staff and I thought the meeting went very well. However, about two weeks later, uh, our, our bill almost got undermined because there were some rumors flying around about that meeting with Cheney that we were bringing diseased buffalo in again. So that stupid brucellosis argument that always comes up almost undermined the bill two years ago. Now, uh, I was in DC three weeks ago and we met with several senators got all kinds of support. Uh, that's why it passed through the House Natural Resource Committee, um, sponsored by Don Young of Alaska, and, um, and then recently passed through the Senate with the introduction by Senator Rounds and, and co-sponsored by Heinrich. So I would hope that at some point, the bill has enough momentum where I can go talk to Wyoming delegates, hopefully next week, uh, where I can get some support from Wyoming. But, you know, politically, unfortunately, the, uh, I won't go there. Uh, it's difficult sometimes to get tribes and the recognition we need. Uh, so I would hope that uh, a conversation could go favorable, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't bet on it, unfortunately. Thanks, and that, you know, gives us an opportunity to let our members know to contact our representatives in Congress and support this. But yeah, thanks for that answer. Uh, the next next question we have is, is there a fair amount of cooperation between the um, Northern Arapaho and Eastern Shoshone tribes regarding wildlife, culture, and opportunity for young folks? Um, a short answer is no. Uh, you know, the federal government often put enemy tribes in the same reservation in the hopes we'd kill each other off. Uh, the two tribes still operate as two tribal governments. We speak two different languages. Uh, we have different spiritual, cultural customs. And so that's even uh, so today, you know, the, the Shoshone tribes, the treaty tribe, the Arapaho tribe, you know, was temporarily placed in 1878 and they were supposed to be in Estes Park. Well, there's a lot of history that, you know, a lot, we went over a bit of it tonight, but um, the federal government failed in that obligation to both the Shoshone and the Arapaho. And so we're left uh, today working out a lot of those challenges. What we do know and what we can emphasize is that we are both Buffalo people, that our grandmas and grandpas were equally dependent upon Buffalo. That's where we have the common ground. That's where we're gonna promote uh, the, the identity for our young people. It's not that you're this tribe and I'm that tribe, and these are my Buffalo, these are my Buffalo. These Buffalo are important to all of us. And, it, and that's what we need to continue to emphasize and focus on is, is what's positive, where we can work together, uh, where we can promote healing uh, and, and dismantle the division. There's enough division in, in already. Uh, we need to continue to work together to heal and uh, Buffalo can be the foundation for that and be a vehicle for moving more opportunities to engage our young people regardless of tribe, uh, but not regardless of tribe, but in, in with the inclusion of both tribes, that, uh, that our, all of our children need this, this exposure again. Uh, 
And so making that, uh, that possible through uh, what I'm proposing is a, is a Wind River Tribal Buffalo Initiative, uh, 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 an entity that can exist in partnership with National Wildlife Federation, Intertribal Buffalo Council, PH Foundation, so that we have a tribally led organization that can steer the direction of our buffalo conservation, but also conservation in general in terms of how we can uh, ensure that our tribal leadership has adequate information when it comes to conservation, whether it's water, air, land, uh, wildlife, forestry, uh, whatever it could be. Uh, this entity can be uh, a foundation again from our cultural values, uh, from a, a, a place-based system that uh, is driven by our, our traditional belief systems. Yeah, that's that's incredibly beautiful that Buffalo can, you know, bring us all together um, in such a really meaningful way. Um, and the next question, I was wondering about this too. Do you herd the Buffalo to a certain area or are they left completely wild? Um, well, Right now, the buffalo are in enclosures. They are not managed as wildlife yet. So, you know, we, they, they are fenced in on, you know, a thousand acres. And the intent is, you know, get them protected as wildlife and retire range units and grazing permits in an expansion area. And then uh, make the necessary steps to manage them as, as wildlife. Um, so no, they they exist in enclosures right now. Um, the goal, what we hope to see down the road, what you know we'll continue to work for for as long as it takes, uh, will be buffalo on the landscape managed as wildlife. But this a this is a, a series of steps in a paradigm shift of recognizing buffalo for their importance ecologically. Uh, but also receiving the support so that we can incorporate them again culturally. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Jason, there's a ton of gratitude for you in the chat. So I know you're talking with us, but I just wanted to point that out that people are really thankful for you being here tonight. Um, the next question and the last one I think I have for now, um, if folks have others, feel free to put your question in the chat. Uh, we'll wrap up right around seven. Um, but is the Pine Ridge Reservation involved in this Buffalo management project? The Pine Ridge Reservation is involved in its own Buffalo restoration project. If uh, you remember, I mentioned that there's 76 member tribes of the Intertribal Buffalo Council. <clears throat> Every tribe of those members have their own Buffalo programs. <clears throat> and so Pine Ridge has its own Buffalo program. Blackfeet, uh, Northern Cheyenne, Crow, actually every tribe in Montana has a buffalo. Not all of them are conservation buffalo, but every tribe has some. Uh, so, you know, there's 50,000 buffalo, I'm sorry, 20,000 buffalo scattered across ITBC tribes. Um, and so Pine Ridge is uh, one of those. Uh, there's very few reservations that have a large land, large enough land base to manage buffalo's wildlife. And a lot of tribes uh, continue with the status quo of treating buffalo like cattle because that's the colonial way to do it, to retire your cattle operation and convert to buffalo is, is, a, is a process that many are taking. But here at Wind River, because of our track record of conservation in wildlife management and the land base, mm -hmm. then I want to take that paradigm step a little further, and that is respect this animal as wildlife on the landscape for, you know, as a way the one above intended it, not driven by an economic based system, driven by an ecological based system for the restoration of this keystone species. Yeah, thank you for that answer. Um, this is a great question that just came up. Do you include a natural, do you include natural carbon sequestration into 
the discussion when talking about the value of your efforts. Obviously, there's a lot, but um, anything focused on carbon sequestration? I certainly do, because uh, buffalo are actually climate resilience, climate resiliency. Uh, they are ecosystem engineers and promote biodiversity. So that statistic that was provided about biodiversity existing on lands managed by indigenous people, this is how it would be if we really had the, uh, the land base still. Uh, but without that and working to restore it, it's based upon that understanding that if you restore this animal, it heals the land. That can be interpreted as increasing plant and animal biodiversity. So that's carbon uh, sequestration in itself. Um, there is going to be an interesting study being promoted, uh, hopefully funded by National Science Foundation and working with uh, folks out of Boise State and University of Nebraska to look at actually the, uh, the influences of buffalo on carbon sequestration in various grassland ecosystems. Uh, so that's a question uh, that academically we're looking at uh, being able to uh, quantify. Wonderful. Um, a question came in the chat about whether this presentation is being recorded. It is being recorded and will be put on Powder River Basin Resource Council's YouTube channel. So we'd encourage you to share and um, we can send out that link when we send out the Give to Buffalo um, donation opportunity to folks. Um, I think that's all for questions. Uh, thank you so much, Jason. And I'll turn it back to, oh, we got one more com coming in here. What are the legal challenges in reclassifying buffalo as wildlife in Wyoming? Or do you have the sovereignty to do that on the ri Wind River in spite of state opposition? That's correct. Uh, we have the sovereignty to make that distinction and designation on the tribal lands on the reservation. Um, well, Wyoming considers bison livestock in the state outside of federal lands like Yellowstone or Grand Teton National Park. There is a level of protection for bison designated as wildlife in the national forest on the north side of the reservation. But uh, for the most part, uh, buffalo don't exist in any state-owned lands as wildlife. Everywhere else, they're considered livestock and treated as such. So on tribal lands here, we can, we can call them what we want. Great. Yeah, awesome question as well. Thanks for asking. Um, well, I think that's uh one more might there be a better place for school children's letter campaigns to get more support from legislators that might just be a suggestion but to involve the youth of the state in pushing for support from our lawmakers is a great idea oh yeah no i think that's a great idea I would be be willing to look for some help on that yeah um and, you know, as a grassroots organi organization that works with folks throughout the state, I think we'd be excited as well. Thank you so much, Jason, for both your knowledge and, and your passion. And just a reminder to everyone, we will be sharing that link that's in the process that could allow us to make contributions to um, the, the Tribal Partnerships Program through National Wildlife Federation, so for everyone's information. So thank you once again. So with that said, we come to a close. Thanks everyone for joining us. And thanks especially to Jason for making this a really memorable evening and event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the invitation to visit with you tonight. Thanks. Uh, for all of uh, the work you guys are doing. And uh, let me know if there's any ways I can, can help. So thank you all, appreciate it. Look forward to working with you together. All right, everybody, that's it. May you all be well, thank you.